chapter 18. Did you know that over 60% of Americans, yes, over 60% believe that Lee Harvey Oswald did not act alone in killing John F. Kennedy? I looked at some of the evidence. Um, I'm not sure whether there was a conspiracy or not. I don't know for sure. I think it's possible. If it was a conspiracy, it was one of the greatest of all time. But in this passage today, we have an even greater conspiracy that took place. Now, what is a conspiracy? Well, it's an agreement to perform together an illegal, wrongful, or subservient, subversive act. And Jesus allowed this conspiracy to happen. He knew it was going to happen. And he could have said, I am, and you are not, when the soldiers came, and they would have all disappeared. Because he spoke the universe into existence. But he didn't do that. He allowed it to happen. Did he want it to happen? God allows evil to happen. He can use it for our good. But I don't think he wants evil to happen. It's not something good. Evil is not good in itself. Well, we could talk more about that, but those who put Jesus on the cross had evil intentions, but God used it to bring salvation to everyone who would believe with their faith in Jesus. But Jesus did not want to suffer on the cross, but he was willing to do it because of his love for us. Okay, John chapter 18, to continue with the study of the life of Jesus, when Jesus had spoken these words, that was at the Last Supper and the priestly prayer, high priestly prayer, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden, in which he entered with his disciples. That was the Garden of Gethsemane. There's more that took place there. We've already talked about that in the last week or two. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place where Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priest and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am he. And Judas, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Therefore he again asked them, who do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these go their way. To fulfill the word which he spoke of those whom you have given me, I lost not one. Simon Peter then having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? I want to look first at the betrayal of Judas. Are you familiar with the word perfidy? <laughs> In the context of war, perfidy is a form of deception. <coughs> <coughs> one person promises, one enemy promises to act in good faith. And then when the other side comes out, they attack them. That's perfidy. And that's exactly what Judas does here. He pretends friendship. He's going to give Jesus a kiss, pretending friendship. Now I'm going to cite uh, some references to the other apostles, the other gospels here, although they were written mainly by apostles. Uh, I want to write uh, or share with you some of what the other gospels say because this is there's a lot that's going on here, and each of the gospels shares a little bit different part of the story. 
And that's what you expect from eyewitness accounts. Each one has a little something different to share. So let's, uh, I want to read from Mark 14, verse 43. Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, came up accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who were with, from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now he who was betraying him had given them a signal saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him and lead him away under guard. After coming, Judas immediately went to him saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. Now the two other gospels add a little more. Luke 22, verses 7, 47 and 48 says, while he was still speaking, behold, a crowd came with the one called Judas, one of the 12 was preceding them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And then Matthew's gospel, in Matthew 26, verses 48 to 50 says, now he who was betraying him gave them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately Judas went to, uh, to Jesus and said, hell rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, what do you feel? What, do what you have come for. Do what you have come for. Now, again, there's little differences, and this is what you expect from eyewitness testimony. There's nothing contradictory. Peter and Judas would both deny the Lord that night. Judas intentionally did so. Peter would not intentionally do so. Could both have been forgiven? Well, we know that Peter was forgiven. What about Judas? I believe he could have been forgiven. But there's no indication he sought forgiveness. And I think that was likely due to his pride, perhaps because of his self-loathing after his treachery. I don't think he sought forgiveness. Now, I may have mentioned this recently that uh, Adrian Rogers once said, a crisis does not make martyrs, it only reveals them. You're a martyr before you ever die for Christ, he says, and you, are, and you may be a martyr without ever dying for the Lord Jesus. In other words, a crisis reveals what's in your heart. If you're someone who will die for the Lord Jesus, and you never have to, you still have the heart of a martyr. Now let me make some practical applications from these verses that we've read. Here's a question for you. Have you really died to yourself to live for Christ? Are you putting his desires in front of your own desires? Are you seeking to please him in life instead of pleasing yourself? Do you know what Peter may have prayed at the end of the day? Something, something like this. God, I, I really blew it today. I made a mess of things. He did. Listen to what Jesus says in the model prayer that he shared with his disciples. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. I know you know those verses. Give us this day our daily bread. Uh, I assume that prayer would normally be prayed in the morning. I mean, if you're praying at night, why wouldn't you pray something like this? Give us this night our daily bread. Or maybe, <laughs> uh, Lord, give us a good night's sleep tonight. <laughs> I like that, don't you? A good night's sleep. Or maybe even, uh, Lord, give me tomorrow our daily bread. Now, why am I making a point of this? Because praying anytime is good, but if you will spend some time in prayer in the morning, it's likely you're going to be better off the rest of the day. What about Peter? When he should have been praying, he had been sleeping. He had trouble with his prayer life. He kept falling asleep, and he was not ready for the trouble that was coming. He was cocky, and he should have been cautious. 
He should have been alive to God in prayer, but instead he was asleep. The private ministry of our Lord with his disciples was now ending. Now think of Judas for a moment. He had lived with the Lord Jesus for over three years. What did he learn? What did he learn? It seems like he learned nothing. What a privilege to actually live with Jesus and listen to him teach. And yet he did not learn. Now, a Roman cohort could include uh, up to 600 men. I don't think you probably had that many to come to arrest Jesus. But there were a lot of soldiers there. We don't know exactly how many. And they were there to arrest Jesus. With, they brought their swords and their clubs. I, I'm thinking Judas must have expected, perhaps they expected, that there might be some fighting take place. I'm not sure. But Jesus was in full control. He knew what would happen. Judas perhaps expected deception. So he said, I'm going to identify Jesus for you by giving him a kiss. Back in that day, and it is the same today, if you want to show affection to someone in your family, you might give them a kiss. Back in that day also, if you were a disciple of a rabbi, you might give the rabbi a kiss. And that's what we see Judas doing here. But Jesus, again, I think Judas was expecting that Jesus might try to hide himself or, you know, just kind of, and he said, I'm going to reveal to you who this Jesus is so you'll know for sure. But Jesus, Jesus was ready for him. He knew what was coming. He was in full control and he shocked both Judas, I believe, and these soldiers by not running and hiding or something like that and not fighting but saying here I am so you have the betrayal of Jesus now we'll look briefly at the bewilderment of the soldiers look at verse 6 again so when he said to them I am he they drew back and fell to the ground why did this happen well we're not it's not entirely clear it could be that the Spirit of God just knocked them to the ground. That would be, God could certainly do that, no problem. Or maybe they just suddenly realized, why, why are we, they may have been convicted by the Holy Spirit and they may have been wondering, what are we doing out here? And out of conviction by the Holy Spirit, they may have fallen to the ground. The scholars have differing opinions about this. I don't know which one it is for sure. Uh, perhaps we're right to think they were both convicted by the Holy Spirit that what they were doing was wrong because of the way he was presenting himself. Or perhaps also God was at work in knocking them to the ground by the work of the Holy Spirit. But when he said, I am, I wonder if the soldiers realized that's an affirmation of his deity. The Romans were outnumbering these disciples, but Jesus was in charge, unafraid. Imagine when they would go to arrest someone else and that person, <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of times when people are arrested, they don't want to give their identification information. Uh, they don't want the police to know who they are. Jesus was willing. This band of soldiers was prepared for conflict, but they were met with surrender and calm, and they were overwhelmed. Again, I don't know which it was for sure, or maybe it was both. Conviction by God's Holy Spirit and God's Spirit knocking them over, but they were bewildered. Pardon me. Yeah. 
let's, let's move from the, the betrayal of Jesus, the bewilderment of the soldiers, to the bravery of Peter. Now, I want to share with you from Luke 27, 22, verses 47 through 53. It gives us a little more of the story. It says, while he, that is Jesus, was still speaking, behold, a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was preceding them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those who were around him saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Stop, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as you would against a robber? While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this hour and the power of darkness are yours. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, outnumbered by this vast number of soldiers, and they only had a couple of swords, Peter bravely took out his sword to do battle, but he'd already lost the fight. You see, we wrestle not against flesh and blood the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But Peter took out the sword and cut off the ear of Malchus. Uh, he was a lousy swordsman. He was more of a fisherman. I'm sure he wasn't aiming for the right ear. He missed what he was aiming for. Peter didn't need to ask the Lord what to do. He knew what to do. He knew what to do. And what he did was wrong. This is a message here for both you and I. There are times we think we know what the right thing to do is, and we don't. We need to seek God and be sure that we're doing what he wants us to do, even when we're sure that we know what the right thing is. Our adversary loves us to fight with one another, and we need to be cautious about this. We need to surrender to the Lord and do what he leads us to do. In the world, there's continual conflict, it seems, sometimes with words, sometimes with objects of war. God wants us to speak the truth and he wants us to share his word with others. Peter would end up denying Jesus three times that night. Uh, let's think about the rooster for a moment. I don't know if I mentioned this. I'm not an expert on roosters. It's probably some of you know a lot more about roosters than I do. Uh, I do not believe back then that you could make them crow. Now, if I'm wrong, you can let me know after church, but it's my understanding. You can't, back then at least. Maybe today you can make a crow, but back then I don't think you could make a crow. And uh, I don't think you could make a crow at just the right time either. <laughs> well, Peter would deny the Lord three times, and the rooster would crow right on schedule. This ought to be in a some information here, important information for Peter. Yes, he was fighting the battle the way he shouldn't have, but Jesus was going to win the battle because Jesus told him what was going to happen. Remember in Luke 22, verse 38, before the betrayal, it says the disciples said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it's enough. Two swords would not be enough to battle a cohort of Roman soldiers. That was not the intention of the two swords. What was the intention? Well, here's my opinion. Uh, so back when Jesus was alive, you continually had people coming to Jesus wanting to help him, wanting to be with him because they loved him and he loved them. 
And I think Jesus is indicating that this is going to change. Now, after he is crucified and resurrected, people are going to seek to kill these disciples and they will be opposed to them. I think uh, Peter's sword here in the Garden of Gethsemane symbolizes rebellion against the will of God. Jesus had told Peter more than once what was gonna happen. And Peter didn't listen to him. He, had, he was fighting the wrong enemy, using the wrong weapon, with the wrong motive, and he accomplished the wrong result. Why did Peter fail so miserably? Well, why do you and I fail sometimes? <laughs> Let's ask that question, perhaps. Uh, but Peter, praise God, would learn the weapon he needed was not a physical sword. It was the word of God. And on the day of Pentecost, he would use God's word, not just the Old Testament, but from what he had heard from Jesus, to speak to the hearts and 3,000 people would be saved and baptized. Again, Jesus did not need Peter's protection. He could have called down 10,000 angels or more. And Jesus then healed Mount, the ear of Malchus. Uh, now, by the way, it's only, I think, in the Gospel of John that the name of Malchus is mentioned. It may be that before that, it, it, by the way, it also says one of the disciples in some of the other Gospels. It doesn't say Peter. And that's perhaps likely because the, those Gospels were written earlier while Peter was still alive. And they didn't want people to arrest Peter for doing something, uh, you know, at that time. And, and they may have been trying to kind of shield Malchus here somewhat. If Malchus was healed by Jesus, let him tell the story. But later on, uh, by the time the Gospel of John was written, uh, Peter was probably already deceased and with the Lord. Uh, and I wonder about Malchus. Uh, here's this, uh, this person they come to arrest, and he heals his ear. Uh, it's, it, you know, I, I, it's not clear to me whether his ear is cut off and falls to the ground, or whether it's cut off and still hanging there but he heals his ear. Now, if these soldiers had wanted to try to uh, take Peter prisoner, they could have uh, charged him with rebellion. But what would be the evidence? Because the ear had been healed. <laughs> there wouldn't be any evidence. So keep in mind this miracle reveals God's grace toward us. If Jesus had the power to stun a mob of soldiers and they fell to the ground, however he did it, and if he had the power to heal the ear of Malchus and he had the power to call down 10,000 angels, he could have saved himself from the cross, but he didn't because of his love for you and I. He did it for us. John 18, 36 says Peter, Jesus later told Peter, my kingdom is not, as of, it's not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would, pardon me, he told this to Pilate. So, uh, my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Now in Matthew 26 verses 50 through 56, tells us what, uh, what happened after Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. When they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him, and behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? 
How then will the scriptures be fulfilled, which say that it must happen this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with your swords and clubs to arrest me, as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the, the, the scriptures of the prophets. And all the disciples left him and fled. He was accused, Jesus was, of crimes he did not commit. And they came to arrest him secretly at night. There was really no justification for what they did. They would later claim um, that the Jewish leaders would claim uh, that Jesus committed three, three crimes at least misleading the nation, opposing paying taxes to Caesar, and saying he is the Messiah, the king. These are fabrications. When Pilate examines Jesus' case, he declares Jesus innocent and repeatedly tells the Jewish leaders, so listen to Luke 23, verse 23, 14, Pilate says, you have brought me this, <coughs> or me, you have brought the, me this man as one who misleads people, but in fact, after examining him in your presence, I have found no grounds to charge this man with these things you accuse him of. <coughs> well, <coughs> by the way, the fact that, the fact that even this story about Peter cutting off the ear of Malchus is even here, is evidence of truth of the account. Even a, a New Testament scholar who denies the inspiration, the inerrancy of scripture, says this story indicates it really happened because the early Christians would not want themselves to be portrayed as violent people. The apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. The, the word inspired means God breathed. We can have total confidence in the word of God. Uh, I have more confidence in the word of God than someone's opinion, no matter who they are. So Mark 14, verses 50 and 51, mentions the disciples fled when the soldiers took Jesus captive. But Mark mentions a minor detail that the others don't mention. Mark 14, 50 says, and they all left him and fled. A young man was following him, that is Jesus, wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body, and they seized him but he pulled free of the linen sheet and escaped naked. Who was this young man? Well, there's various suggestions. One is that he was just a young man trying to get a good night's sleep in the garden. And that's why he just had this linen sheet on him. <laughs> uh, another writer said, maybe he was the owner of the garden. And, and he, he was used to letting Jesus come and, and sleep there. He was the owner. Um, that's another view. Um, I think it's most likely, there's some other views about this too. I think it's most likely that this is John Mark who would write the Gospel of Mark. He is the only writer of the Gospels who mentions this young man. Now, who is John Mark? By the way, we mentioned this in Sunday school this morning. I thought that was interesting. In Acts 12, 12, it says, Peter went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. So perhaps the Lord's Supper took place at the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. And John Mark uh, was probably kind of curious about what's this meeting all about? 
And maybe he got up out of bed when they left and he just grabbed the linen cloth and put it on him and, and went out and followed them. And he was still following Jesus when they, when they tried to arrest him and, and he ran off naked. Um, I think this likely was John Mark. Uh, but uh, I could spend another five or 10 minutes going with you through <laughs> other suggestions. So let me just conclude with these with these uh, statements. Uh, first of all, don't be like Judas. Turn from your sins. Put your faith truly, uh, truly believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. He is who He claimed to be. And read and study the Word of God so you'll know who He is, and you can come to worship Him more accurately. Second, fully surrender to Jesus. And Peter would do this. Uh, he wasn't fully surrendered to Jesus that night when he pulled out the sword and when he denied Christ three times. But he would fully surrender to Jesus. And third, another point we can draw from this passage, share his love with others. That's why he went to the cross. That's why he allowed himself to be arrested because of his love for you and I. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, I'm so thankful for your love. I'm so thankful that you went to the cross to die for our sins. Help us to never take that for granted, but to always be thankful. Help us fully surrender our lives to you. If there's someone listening to me, does not know you as Savior, I pray they would turn from their sins and put their faith in you as Savior and Lord. Lord, I thank you for this time of worship and I ask that you would help us to again fully surrender our lives to you and do whatever it is you call us to do. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.